Good morning. Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. We're, we're grateful to be able to enter your homes this week as we have, hopefully this will be the last week that we're virtual rather than being able to come back together. We would encourage you to worship with us this morning. Uh, stand and sing wherever you are in your homes. scriptural reading is from 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of a reverence for God. Let's pray. Lord, we magnify your name today. You are the King of kings, Lord of lords. You sit high above all that's created. You are the creator. And Lord, we magnify your name. You are great, you're holy, you're good, you're loving. And Lord, we just have such, such a love for you. Lord, uh, today we, we thank you for the, the healing the healing that you provided to those that are in our congregation, those who have fought off uh, illness. Lord, we, we know that you have walked side be just right beside each of us through this, through, our, through all of the, the, the trials of it. And Lord, I, you've just been so, so faithful. Lord, my prayer was that, that we should bring all of us through this safely. And, and Lord, you have done so. And Lord... Uh, we thank you and we glorify you for this. Lord, uh, 
Lord, we ask that uh, you be over our hearts and, uh, as we address the, the situations in our nation. Lord, our nation is filled with hate, division. There's so much controversy. There's so many people finger pointing. There's so many accusations. Lord, help us to unify. Help us as Christians to be people of peace and hope. Lord, we, we ask for blessings upon our country. We ask for blessings upon our president and for all of our presidents, no matter who they may be. Lord, guide their hands, guide their hearts. Let your Holy Spirit convict them about their actions. Lord, help them to, to walk in your ways. Lord, we ask that you protect our con constitution. Lord, we ask that, that your hand be over this country and continue to protect us. Protect the remnant of Christians that uh, in this country, that the, the, the restrainer of society, the Holy Spirit that's within us that keeps our nation on course. Lord, we ask for this protection and this guidance. And Lord, we have so many things to be thankful for and so many things to be shameful for. Lord, today, let us look on our hearts, look on our minds, look on our actions. Let us be introspective. Allow us to be honest with ourselves. Let us come humbly before your throne. Let us look at where we've fallen short as a people, as a congregation, and as a nation. And Lord, help us to make those changes, to make amends, and to move in a new and a different and a fresh way in 2021. Lord, give us the power through your Holy Spirit to accomplish this, as we know we cannot do anything in our own will. And so, Lord, we're asking that you be beside us this year. Walk tightly with us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, I encourage you all to stand to worship with us. about that line that I will proclaim the glory of the risen Lord who once was slain to reconcile a man to God. There is 
no other form of religion in any capacity. And I always hate that word religion because it's man somehow trying to get to God. But there is no other way to God except what he has provided by the most impossible of things, a person dying for our sin and coming back from the dead. And we give him praise this day. Oh 
offer our sacrifice of praise to you, Lord God. We give you all the honor and glory to your name, and we exalt your holy, holy name. We thank you for your divine mercy, for we've sung about the mercy seat, the mercy that extends to all sinners, to all people. Father, mercy is so great that if we come in repentance before you, you give us a gift a gift of your very life, a freedom of your life, freedom from sin, freedom from the debt that we were to pay, but you paid for us. We give you thanks, Lord, this day. We give you our heart's gratitude for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, to pay for our sins mm -hmm. and make a way to the Father. We give you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
of our soul, praising our Savior all the day long, that though our sins are many, countless, your mercy is more. And we give you the glory and the honor and the praise this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much uh, to our music ministry team. Um, just they set they set the tone of, of worship every week so well. And, uh, and and Lord, that is that is our goal is to to worship you in all ways to acknowledge you and to elevate your name. Um, last week, we we uh, we addressed uh, the the idea of of the holiness of God. And uh, as we covered Isaiah chapter six, we spoke about the holiness of God, how He is so far above everything that was created and that all things were created through him. He is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He alone sits on his throne above all of creation. Yet, we have the unique privilege of being made in the likeness of God. We are the one created being that is in his image. And so we have a duty to a responsibility to reflect, reflect that, that image, to reflect that Christ-likeness in our lives. Yet we often choose instead to rebel and to follow the prince of this earth. There are so many ways in which we stray. And if you're honest with yourself, you know that you do and I do and we all do. Yes, the pastor does too. We all walk so far away. Don't ever elevate anybody or anything uh, that think that, that it's going to be perfect like God. God is so far above. And so today I have a message, uh, the message on genuine repentance, really how turning away from our sins and, and, and really facing clearly towards what God has for us redirects our lives and, and to, to, to truly be honest with ourselves and move into repentance so that we can move towards holiness. Uh, I have a special video for you guys today that uh, you'll really enjoy. It's, it's from Terry Smith. He's the vice president of church ministries for the Christian Missionary Alliance. So take a look at this message and then I'll be right back with a message on repentance for you. Recently, I had a Zoom meeting scheduled for 8.30 on a Saturday morning. I typically declare no alarm Saturday and get up quite a bit later than usual and move at a slower pace. So I thought, you know, I could just put on a nice shirt and stay in my pajamas uh, for this meeting. Eventually, I chose not to do so, but I'm guessing some of you have probably done that over the last several months. And I wonder if sometimes we do something similar in our spiritual lives. The public appearance is good, but we know there are some things hidden under the surface that are not pleasing to Christ. It could be a grudge that you're holding against someone that is allowing a root of bitterness to grow up in you. It could be a secret sexual sin. It might be racial attitudes that do not reflect the love of Jesus Christ. It is even possible that there's corporate sin in your church's past that needs to be dealt with. And certainly as a nation, we have sins such as abortion that need to be confessed and turned from. Whatever it is, Sin grieves and quenches the Holy Spirit. It negatively impacts the flow of God's blessing. It hinders our relationships. It keeps us from doing and being all that Jesus desires. But in his love and mercy, the Lord stands ready to forgive if we will bring our sin into his light and come clean in confession and repentance. 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' Son purifies us from all sin. In this week of prayer, allow the Holy Spirit to expose what needs to be cleaned up in your life and then bring it under the blood of Jesus Christ. Today we'll be uh, discussing uh, repentance directly from Revelation um, chapter 1 through 3. So you can turn to your, in your Bibles to that section as we'll be in that shortly. Uh, I'd like to first set up a few things uh, for us to understand before we move into those scriptures as we analyze each of the, the churches and what Jesus had to say to each of them. 
the, the main thought I'd like to, to get across to you guys today, the most important thing, would be to be holy. Be holy, for I am holy, as it's commanded in, in uh, Leviticus 11.45. So why be holy? Well, the word commands it. In 1 Peter 1.16, it says, For it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. It's also because of whom we belong to. Um, in Leviticus 11.44, it says, I am the Lord your God. Therefore, consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. We need to consecrate individually. Consecrate yourself, therefore, and be holy for I am the Lord your God, it says in Leviticus 27. We also need to corporately, as a, as a, as a church body, as families, we need to consecrate corporately. In Leviticus 19.2, it says, Speak to the whole congregation of Israel and tell them, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. They were holy as a nation because God was holy. And we need to be holy as a nation and as a church and as a family because God is holy. In 1 Peter 1.19, it refers to Jesus as the lamb without blemish or defect. In the same way, in the exact same way, Ephesians refers to the correct state of the church as holy and without blemish. Our goal is Christ-likeness or holiness, but that starts with repentance. So here's the problem, and if we're honest with ourselves, and we look at ourselves as a church congregation, or as the church in America in general, we, we've, we realize that we've become really comfortable. I mean, we haven't been persecuted all that much in America compared to all the other countries thus far. We've become sort of comfortable. It's almost like a great big lounge chair. And so we've sat down in the battlefield. We're now inwardly focused rather than outwardly focused. We're like, well, I hope that the furniture matches, or I hope that the lighting is perfect, or I hope that we have this type of music that we can worship to. I don't like worshiping to that kind of music. And we've become so petty. Think about that. We are, we are so soft as Christians. And, and instead, we should really be thinking about the grandparents that don't know Christ, the moms that don't know Christ, the fathers that don't know Christ, the kids that don't know Christ, the, the, the entire organizations that are formed out there that are running and operating that do not know Christ. We should be infiltrating. We should be getting into each of these areas. And the people that are very difficult to, 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 to listen to, to be around and to talk to, they need Christ more than anybody. They are sending out a signal that says, I need Christ. Our hearts really aren't burdened enough as they should be for the things of God's kingdom and for the people that should be included in it. He loves all of his children. Why don't we? Why don't we? Why do we call some people enemies instead of loving all God's children into Christ? Also, as a nation, I have to say there's great shame in what our nation has done. We have become sheep, sheep that are following the ungodly. We have taken routes that we were never intended to take as a nation. We've justified abortion, the killing of millions of children. We've condoned homosexuality and called it just part, uh, another choice, uh, another option. Um, it is, oh, we've said it's something you're born with, and we know that that's not true. Look at God's word. We've encouraged transgenderism. We've, we've accommodated sexual redefinition. We've even made uh, special restrooms and, and all sorts of different things. We, we say, okay, well, this person calls themselves a, a boy, so I'm going to call them a boy, although they're a girl. Uh, this is insanity. We've moved... We've moved from, from the logical to the illogical. We, we have political viciousness and, and slanders that should never occur. We, we listen to the, all these falsehoods and we, we repost them and we encourage them. We, we, we follow 
people instead of God. And we've, ta- and we've decided to, to follow this humanistic, secular empowerment movement rather than to become humble and to follow God's lead. We've accepted what people say over God, and we've embraced socialism over freedom. If what we get is what we're moving towards, and it'll be what we deserve because it's what we've moved towards. We have to repent and move away from these things. We have to stand firm and confront with the Bible. That's what Christ did. That's what Christ did with the devil as he was being tempted in the desert. Why won't we confront with the word? Why do we just fall right into it as sheep? Today, I'm going to talk to you about holiness. Strong's defines holy as sacred. It's set apart for God in the likeness and the nature of the Lord. Are we holy? Are we in that same nature? Do we love the things he loves? Do we hate the things he hates? Do we stand firm? As Ephesians says, stand firm and then stand firm some more. Do we do that? Vine states that holiness is to make a person the opposite of koinos or common. To make us opposite of common. That means the opposite of the world. The world is common. The the world system says there's a pattern to this world. Don't be part of that pattern. A.W. Tozer defines holiness this way in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. He says, We know nothing like the divine holiness that stands apart, it's unique, it's unapproachable, it's incomprehensible and unattainable. The natural man is blind to it. He may fear God's power and admire his wisdom, but he cannot even imagine his holiness. Well, in Chip Ingram's book, God as he longs for us to see him, he asks an important question. How should God's holiness impact your life and mine? Well, truly, exposure to God's holiness, it should lead to clear, clear, honest introspection. Can you be honest with yourself? I I spent a lot of time at this pulpit last night being honest with myself. And, and And I prayed. I can't ask you to repent and to seek holiness if I don't also myself. And so I repented of many things in my own attitudes, in my own actions, in my, my, my own words. And, and so much of what has been poured into me over so many years, I've got to pour back out into the garbage can and try to embrace what Jesus Christ wants for my own life. So we have that honest introspection. We also have an overall realignment. As you come to Christ, You're a new creation in Christ. The former ways have passed away. You've now got to truly, truly realign. You know, we we, we often say, you know, just come to Christ. Or, you know, I just kind of of let him in my heart. No, you need to surrender. You need to change how you're thinking. You need to line up with the king. If you're truly going to follow the king, you need to get on one knee and believe in in what he believes in, to truly follow him. And so we need an overall realignment. And then we need daily readjustments because there's so many little things that seep into our lives. It's so easy to hear something and react to it, to to see something and and it causes you to say something or do something. Uh, Just to give you a great example, in traffic, you know, there's, there's a tendency to react and the things that are right underneath our skin will come out. And so we need those daily readjustments as well. So what is God overall calling us to in this this holiness? It's a Christ-likeness. And as every person who is in Christ understands, they should be changed. They should be transformed. They should be different because of their relationship with Christ. You can, you can hear God saying, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts you were in in your ignorance. Ignorance. Rather, live like the Holy One who called you. The holy, uh, Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That's in 1 Peter 1, 
verses 14 through 16. So as, as Christians, we, we should begin to have the desires for things uh, that God desires, not the things of this world, and allow his power to come over us. In Eugene Peterson's book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, a book which I was reading this week, he said such dissatisfaction with the world as it is, is a preparation for traveling in the way of Christian discipleship. And that reminded me of another book, Pilgrim's Progress, that travel, right? That travel that occurred there. And, and as we travel, they are, there are things that we see and we learn along the way, and we should be different because of that experience. And so we should not remain where we were. You don't come to Christ and remain right there. It is a lifetime of sacrifice, of change, of moving towards knowing, knowing God, and knowing God's meaning, uh, what meaning and purpose he has decided was specifically for your life, because your life is different than mine, and we all have our purpose, and we need to find that. Now, the Oxford Companion on Christian Thought said it very clearly what that Christian life should look like. The Oxford Companion on Christian Thought said, the character of a human life, which is ordered so as to be consciously centered on him and his service. Holiness as purity, wisdom, and innocence. And a holy life is one that is consecrated, that's set aside for God, into the holiness of Christ. Lived out in the mutual love, fidelity of God, and the hope for the kingdom, which is the foundation of the church. We have this forward thought. We realize that this isn't all there is. And I'm not living for me, and I'm not living for now. I'm living here and now, but I'm also living as a, as a citizen and as, uh, of the kingdom of God. And I'm moving in that direction. That is where my eyes are focused. And that is what I am heading towards. What you face towards is the direction you're going to go. Further went on to say, holiness is humanity's conforming to the prior holiness of God. And that's where the nation of Israel realized they needed to be. They needed to follow the holiness that God had already, already shown them. Romans 12, 2, one of my favorite verses, it shows that this requires action on our part, right? It really does, both mentally and physically, uh, spiritually, we need to... Uh, and also have a discipline about the practice. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And there is a pattern, believe me. There is a pattern. You just get away from the word for a day. You get away from it for a week. You get away from it for a month. And you just watch where you're going to end up. You just get away from prayer for a little bit. And you begin to think differently. You begin to, to hear a little less from God. It's not that he's not speaking. You're just not used to hearing his voice. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing, the making new of your mind. Then, and only then, you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I was, uh, I was involved in, in jail ministry uh, for a while, and, and it was such a blessing. In fact, I was called to minister uh, to the sex offenders ward and, and that was the last place that I really wanted to be. And so I knew that's the place I needed to be because I knew if I didn't need to be there as a minister uh, in my heart that something was wrong with my heart, so I made myself go. I volunteered for it, and God changed my heart. So I'm going to read you a story from the jail ministry, and it's a story, it's a story from a man named Morris uh, Gilliard. He said this, and this could be any of us in any of our ways of running in different directions. He said in his own life, and by the way, he's a prisoner. This is a, a prison Bible, and these are stories from prisoners. He said, I've done so many things that counted for nothing. I've always rebelled against my father, who was a preacher, and grew up believing nothing could touch me. I started by forging checks. Checks led to credit card crimes. The feds got me on forgery and possession of marijuana. But that didn't teach me anything. I still didn't believe anything really bad could happen to me. I got out of prison and I decided that nine to five work wasn't going to earn me the kind of money I was used to. 
I was in so much pain and had so much hurt, I picked up where I left off and got picked up again. The cycle continued, out of jail, then back in, and always the same feeling of not being able to forgive myself for shaming my family. I was so tired of my life. I hit bottom after getting arrested yet again, and I wanted to die so badly. I said to God, you've got to give me something to hold on to because I can't go on. I opened the Bible after that in Isaiah 54, verses 7 through 8, and read words that burned into my heart. For a brief moment, I left you, because, but because I love you so much, I will bring you back. For a moment, I turned my face away from you. I was very angry with you, but I will show you my loving concern. My faithful love will continue forever. He heard that, those words. Those are words that God intended for him to hear. That was the beginning. That was the beginning. There were, there were more ups and downs. I, I had messed up my life from age 24 to 38, and it was time to stop testing God and trust him with every part of my life. I'm looking forward to starting over again. I really believe my life up, up to now was orchestrated by God to bring me to him. I'm going to serve him after I leave here. There are a lot of young people out there living like I did. God can do the same thing for them that he did for me. I did so many things in my life that counted for nothing. Now, my life is filled with joy, meaning, and purpose following him. See how he turned his life, he repented, he moved away from self-gratification towards self-empowerment, from, from running every which direction other than God. He embraced God for himself. It wasn't his father's decision anymore. It wasn't his mother's decision anymore. It became his and not only did he run to God, but then he served God. Now, he may be in prison for quite a while still. Um, he may be in prison today even. But he's free on the inside. Some of us are free right now. We're not in prison, but we're not free on the inside. He's free. There is a, there's a bondage to sin. Uh, there's a burden. And we need to be free of that. We need to be free in Christ. If we repent and pursue holiness, we'll begin to move away from the futility of former thinking. We'll begin to think as God does and act as he does, to, to, to desire the things he does. Our will begins to match up with his will. This is the true sanctification process we hear about, but it doesn't just happen. It happens because we surrender. It's because we surrender every day. It's because we really do confront those things in our lives. We're honest with ourselves and we're honest with others. I really encourage an accountability partner if you don't have one. I encourage mentors. I encourage someone who's willing to tell you the truth about certain things in your life. I want you to be truly free to experience the blessing of walking hand in hand with Christ as a Christian walk is intended to be, seeing life Clearly, not through some type of glasses that this world is trying to hand you, but really seeing it walking in the light. So what does true repentance look like? We ask ourselves, you know, what, what does it really look like if I, I truly do repent? Well, Eugene Peterson, he, he said in, this, uh, in a guidepost article, he said, you don't repent by taking a deep breath and then sort of feeling better. You only repent when you turn around and go back and towards God. It doesn't make any difference how you feel. You can have that feeling or you don't have that feeling. What's essential is that you do something about it. The, the call to repentance is not a call to feel the remorse of your sins. It is the call to turn around so that God can do something about them. So let me clarify that. What it's saying is it's, it's, it's not just enough to, to be sad about things that you've done and to, to apologize to God about them. You need to do something about them. You need to stop. Stop and move forward in a new direction. You need to stop going this way. Cold turkey, 180 degrees, and move the other direction. 
So let me show you what repentance is not. Repentance is not hiding or concealing until we get caught. It's really, it's, instead, it's transparency. Saying, you know, I'm going to come clear about, clean about this. This is, this is what I did. I know nobody even knows. But I need somebody else to know, and I need you to know, Lord. And I need to just come clean, and I need to walk away from this. I need to call sin what it is, sin. Repentance is also not just remorse for getting caught. Yeah, a lot of people are really... Uh, sad about being caught. There's a lot of prisoners in there that are really remorseful about being caught. But most of them run right back to what, they, what they'd formerly done. They weren't really, really repenting. True repentance is not remorse for getting caught. Third, remorse is not denial or acting like it didn't happen. Fourth, it's not justifying or making excuses for why you did it. Instead, it's listening to all that has been done, not defending it, calling it what it truly is, and that takes, that takes some humility. Fourth, it's not avoidance or a hasty exit to avoid the issue. A lot of us would like to run past that issue really quick I, I know personally, you know, I don't like to, 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 to look at some of the, the things that I do wrong. I like to run past them really quick. That's probably my, my, my greatest thing is I, I recognize it and I don't want to look at it any longer. And, and, and I understand it and I want to move on. But really what we need to do is to stop. We need to stop and, and, and not make that hasty exit. We need to not avoid it. We need to really look at it. Uh, really, real repentance is not being guilted into forgiveness it's it's really wanting forgiveness repentance is not uh, just saying I'm sorry but it's actions that show that you're actually sorry it's truly making amends there's evidence that you're moving the other way real repentance also is not resenting accountability I know a lot of folks do not like accountability. They are not willing to take creative criticism for others who are, are saying, look, you know, I think you're treading in some dangerous ground in an attitude you have. You seem angry. You seem judging. You seem critical or whatever that may be. We should not resent accountability. We should not resent church involvement or discipline. Scripture clearly lays out if we cannot handle issues among each other that we should address, we should bring in a second, you know, a person into that. We should involve the church eventually. We should have church discipline if necessary. Why? Because the more that, that it's, it's directly addressed and in so many different ways, it's to truly restore and bring that person to a point of repentance. It's, it's important. And finally, repentance is not being too prideful to accept that help. We need to be able to be willing to say, you know, I'm not an island. I need other people. I really do need that help. And some things I cannot do under my own help. Um, I know that, that, that I've had friends come to me that have said that, and we've sat there and we've worked through things together. And their willingness to do so was what brought them to a new stage in their walk. It wasn't the fact that I was advising them as much as the, the fact that they were, were finally allowing someone else to help them. They were finally willing to humble themselves. In Luke um, chapter 3, John the Baptist calls those who repent to show it by their fruit. A proud man will not acknowledge his wrongdoing. In fact, he will bark at you for telling him that he is doing something wrong. If you find yourself doing that, it's, it's pride. It's pride. Pride is what causes us to sin. We think we're, we're too good for. We, we know too much. Um, I think one of the greatest things that leads us away from Christ is our ability to reason. Instead, we should reason through the scriptures and truly see the truth in them. All right, so what is our motivation for making this re repenting? Well, one, 
that I, I, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm, it, says, it says in Revelation, uh, the, the first chapter, verse 3, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. We should feel at all times that the time is near. Be ready. We should be ready at all times for Christ's return. We should uh, really be able to enjoy the blessings of love, of belonging, of meaning, and of purpose. But every time that we stray away from what God has planned for us, we put all of that on hold. Second, we should be in awe of Christ's work. If Christ's work on the cross, his sacrifice on the cross doesn't motivate you, it really should. Revelation 1.5 says, Before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. If we have that type of mentality towards the work that Christ has done, that should motivate us to want to repent. And third, because of who you are. I spent every Monday for, it was, I can't even remember how long it was. It was maybe six months to a year. And what we did is we studied nothing but who you are. Who does God say you are? A royal priesthood, a holy nation. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if someone told you suddenly that, that you're a prince? You are a royal prince. Imagine being 15 years old after going through all your life, living in a common household, doing common things, Someone telling you at age 15, you're a royal prince. You are, you are to a, a, a royal priesthood. Wouldn't you suddenly see yourself differently? Wouldn't you suddenly want to live differently? Because of who you are, who you truly are. When you come to that realization and understanding that you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God has called each of us. Not those who've just gone to theological training and, and seminary, but all of us, a royal priesthood. You see yourself differently. You realize that I can't still continue the same way I was walking before, the same way I was talking before, the same hatred that was in my heart before. I can't still call people my enemies. I can't still walk in such a way as to show disrespect for my position. I am called to live differently. And fourth, I can, uh, one of the motivations for repenting is, is really that I can, I can really walk away from holiness and I can, I can really fall asleep at times, but I need to wake up to the call. And I realize that that, that happens in my life. It happens in all of our lives, if we're honest. So let's take a look at what the churches in Revelation are going to teach us in this. We're going to see that, that Jesus says, I know your deeds. But a lot of times he's also saying, but. But I have this against you. And so, so he, you're seeing a church that's often either focused in the wrong direction or they're just asleep and lukewarm. And so we don't want to ever be that, and we need to look at and say, was I that way this last week? Am I that way today? Am I just sort of tuning in, but I'm doing other things at the same time? Um, you know, do I really give God my best all the time? Well, if you notice, I always wear, you know, I always wear appropriate clothing. Um, I mean, I could come up here and I could preach in, 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 uh, in a t-shirt and shorts, and it, it wouldn't uh, hurt the gospel any, but I want to give God my very, very best. And when, when you want to give God your very, very best, it takes very small pieces of discipline every single day. I make my bed in the morning because I want to be disciplined. I get into the Word in the morning because I want to be disciplined. I get up early because I want to be disciplined. I want to be disciplined because I don't I want to allow myself to, to begin to slip away. It only takes very small things to begin to slip away. So, um, in this, we look at, uh, let's take a look at each of the churches. For instance, let's take a look at the church at Ephesus. Um, if we go to chapter 2, verse 1, 
This is Jesus confronting each of the churches. He says, I know your deeds, your, your hard work and your perseverance. I, I know you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and, and have, have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and, 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 and have not grown weary. And, and it's focused on all the good things that you're doing. Yet, yet in verse 4, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. In other words, you're just, you're just going through the motions. You're maybe serving in, in, in the music ministry or you're, you're, you're uh, ushering or you're doing any number of different things. You're, you're cleaning around the church. But when's the last time you opened with God's word? You've lost your first love. You know, you're, you talk a lot about the word. You study the word. You're diligent. But when's the last time you shared the gospel with your neighbor? When's the last time you, uh, you truly gave out of your heart towards the church? When, is the, when have you been holding back, really? And God is saying, you're holding back on me. You've become lukewarm in so many ways. You forgot to do the things you did at first. Then he, he says, repent. And do the things you did at first. If you do not repent... I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. In other words, you are my child, but if I have to, I'm going to discipline you because I, will, I love you. And sometimes that discipline is rough. To him who overcomes, though, he promises a reward. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is the, par the paradise. All right, now. It says right in here in Smyrna, let's take a look at the second church. I know your afflictions, your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. You see there, there's, there, will be, there will be suffering. Sometimes there will be persecution. There will be things in our own government that will, will shock us. There will be, there'll be, there'll be things that come against Christianity. And what we need to do is we not, do need to lose our Christianity in our response. We need to realize that these things are promised to happen. And, and our light suffering compared to the rest of the world is light suffering. We need to instead focus. Focus and be faithful to the point of death. Not angry. Seek peace. Give hope. And we need to show direction to those who are saying, why is this happening? Well, we show here clearly in Scripture, it's going to happen. Let me show you what God said. Let me show you the hope that lies within me for this nation because I know that God has something bigger. God has something bigger for you as an individual. Let's take a look at the next church, the church of Pergamum. In verse, in verse 13, it says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me. It sounds like a strong walk, doesn't it? it? Sounds like a strong walk. Yet in verse 14, he says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You, you have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrificed to idols, and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you have those who have who, who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaeans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. See, we sometimes can be like the people of, of Pergamum. We can, we can be so for Christ, but we become synchronous, synchronistic. You can't be both a Buddhist and a Christian. You can't be both a Hindu, a Hinduist and a, and a Christian. You cannot... You cannot serve the, 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 the philosophies of, of our world and the postmodern thoughts and still serve God. You cannot just 
bring it all together and say, well, all ways lead to God. We see that a lot in our culture. That just shows a lot of ignorant people that haven't opened any, any of the religious texts of any religion because every religious text opposes the other in, in what it says. You cannot see a, a, a joint truth that combines in any of those. And so you must say that they're all either fake or one is true and the rest are speaking untruth. And so you have to look for truth yourself. You have to say, does the Bible speak truth to me and to my heart? I see that it does. It has changed my life and it can change yours. Let's take a look at the next one. Thy Thy Thyatira. In Thyatira, uh, which is in verse 19, uh, it, it, of chapter 2 it says I know your deeds your love and your faith your service and your perseverance that you are now doing more than you did at first well that sounds really good right they're, they're improving Never, nevertheless in verse 20 Christ admonishes him nevertheless I have this against you you tolerate you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess by her teaching she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrifices to idols. I have given her time to repent. Christ is so merciful. He, he shows all of us a time to repent. Yet, he does call us upon it. He said, unless they repent of her ways, I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. I will repay each of you according to your deeds. But then again, he promises a reward. To him over, who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. And I see this very much as that, that end times promise. As we come back and we rule with Christ, he says in verse 27, he will, he will rule them with an iron scepter and he will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give uh, him the morning star. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And we will come back and we will rule with Christ. And uh, it's just a, it's an amazing thing to, to think that, that we will serve beside our Lord and Savior in the restored kingdom in time. Let's go on to the third chapter here in, in the church of Sardis. Let's see what he has to say to the church of Sardis. Now, this is a church that was active but spiritually dead. How many of us have done that? Been very active but been spiritually dead at the time. He says, I know your deeds, but you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my, of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent but if you do not wake up I will come like a thief and you will not know at which time I will come to you it says in verse 5 here he who overcomes will be like them be dressed in white and I will never blot out his name in the book of life and 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 but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels he who overcomes will be dressed in white he'll be pure He's pure, right? And his name will not be blotted out in the, in, in, in the, uh, the book of life. Uh, you know, when I read that, that scriptural verse right there, it's reminding me of, of, of a temple that I went into in Vietnam. Uh, it was the temple of literature. And I saw these great big stone uh, tablets. And there was all these names in Chinese on there because that's what they used to, uh, to write in before the Vietnamese language was, was designed by the French. And, and so they, they were writing these names in Chinese. But I, I said to my guide, I said, uh, I said, I noticed there's a turtle at the bottom of these, these tablets. I said, so these must have been uh, relate, relating to learning. And she said, yes, that's correct. This used to be, before it was a temple, it was a college. And each of these names were men who distinguished themselves in learning. And I said, but there's spaces here. What are the spaces for? And she said, those were names that were blotted out. She goes, these were men who distinguished themselves and their names were once on these tablets, but they'd been blotted out because they dishonored themselves through something they'd said or done. Let's not dishonor ourselves before the Lord. 
Let's take a look at scripture again. We're again in the third chapter. Let's come down to verse 8. He's addressing the, the, the church. Jesus is addressing the church at Philadelphia. And this is a good report. He says, I know your deeds. Um, see, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are the synagogue of, uh, of, um, of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the, the world to test those who live in the earth. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of God. And I will also write on him my new name. And that new name really reflects your new character. You should have a new character in Christ. Are you a character or do you have a new character? <laughs> Ask yourself that. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the last church. The last church here is in chapter 3, verse 15. It says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would say that's the greatest statement towards the American church. We're lukewarm. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm to spit you out of my mouth. You say I, I, uh, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not re recognize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. We, we think that we're so smart. We think that we figured it all out. And God says, no, no. You think you're wealthy. He says, I can take that from you. I'll show you, but you won't, you won't like the way I show you. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. That's, that's a great promise. It's a great promise to those who are in Laodicea, and it's a great promise to all of us. Don't be lukewarm. Be on fire. Be passionate. Is there something that you're really passionate about? Think about it. What are you most passionate about? Is it God or is it something else? I mean, God gives us passions for different things in our life, but our very first passion should be God. Otherwise, we've created an idol. We need to really think about those things in our life that are coming up and, and standing in front of, of, of God that are becoming bigger than and more important than him. So we saw in each of our churches a, uh, a different type of sin. In Ephesus, they'd forsaken their first love, right? In Smyrna, he just encouraged them to have persistence, not to give up. Maybe they were giving up a little bit. And they, he said that, that suffering produces holiness. We should be willing to suffer for Christ. In Pergamum, they'd accepted synchronism. They were just saying the way of all ways, it all just, it's all okay. We can just take in any, everything and uh, it's all good. All the ways lead to him and anything we want to do uh, is just fine because God just wants us to be happy. Um, and that's not true. In, in Thyatira, we, they tolerated sin. They said, well, you know, it, it's okay. We're just going to we're just going to allow this, or, you know, this is just our culture. It didn't shock them anymore. If certain things you're tolerating on TV or certain things you're tolerating in music or certain thoughts that you're just tolerating and, and, and you're just, you know, well, you know, it's just how I am. It's how God made me. If you're just tolerating those things, repent. In Sardis, he said, wake up. You're active. You're doing a lot of stuff, but you're spiritually dead. Instead, do it because you're walking with Christ. You're getting deep with him. In Philadelphia, it was a good report. It was encouraging endurance and patience that we, we hope that, that God would say to us, just to, you know, just endure a little further. Be patient. Serve me. Be faithful to the end. Finish well. But a lot of us are like Laodicea. We're lukewarm. We're just kind of, you know, we'll tune in for an hour of sermon and and, and music, and then we'll just tune out, and then we'll just go on with the rest of our lives. 
Monday starts a totally different way. Don't be those people. So our final area that I'd like to really address is repenting from our unholiness, right? When we come face to face with God, we come face to face with what Christ has done for us, and we come face to face with our identity as who Christ says we truly are. You know, no matter what race you are, no matter what age you are, no matter what sex you are, you're important to Christ. And you have a purpose. And God has called you. We need to use the framework of, of the seven churches and look at it and say, am I committing one of these sins? Do I, can I be honest with myself and say, you know, am, that my, my goal is heavenly or is my goal earthly? We need to repent of our, our pers- in our personal lives. What are we tolerating? Is it sexual morality, listening to false teachings, following false leaders and political communities and, and life philosophies as our way rather than God? Are we divisive even within the church? Are we trusting in our own strength, our own power, our wealth, our influence? Are we, we thinking about our earthly citizenship more than our heavenly one? Do we spend all of our time stirring the pot of discontent rather than giving peace and hope to others? Are, have we fallen into that? Too much of our society has. Are we opening our Bible every day to hear what God has planned for us? Be honest with yourself. You're not growing and you wonder why. Are you not in the Word? Are we taking time to hear from Him and to speak to him in prayer every day? Or are we just doing it at certain times and uh, not really, it's more obligatory than it is, it is a, it's sort of like a, a routine rather than it is a, 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 a heartfelt desire. Be honest with yourself. Every day, in every way, we should be shedding the old self. I found, found this uh, snake skin in the garage um, in, in my old house just before we, we moved up here. And, and, and I was thinking about that, how the snake sheds its skin and then it gets a, a fresh new look. And that's a lot like Christians. We need to shed that old self, that old snake, and, uh, and become the new self, the new creation that God has already said we are instead of embracing what we once were. Then that's an individual thing, but then we need to think about it as a church. What, what wrong sins, wrong attitudes, stubbornness possibly, a, a way of holding on to certain things or tolerating certain things or not being teachable, not being moldable, saying, well, this is the way I've always done it um, or this is the way I like it and uh, we're not thinking about others. We, I have to repent, and, and I'm sure we all do, of, of, of different stubbornnesses that way because there's certain preferences we have. But can we let our preferences go so that we can bring in others, so that we can enlarge the kingdom, that we can enlarge the church, and that by enlarging our hearts towards others rather than saying, no, I want it my way. We need to really look at our hearts. Billy Graham says it very well. Repentance is changing our mind about three things. Yourself, with first of all, God, yourself, and your needs. He said, you change your mind and Christ will transform it. So change your mind today. That means to change your mind, to change your heart, to change your attitude. You change your mind and he'll change your heart. I like that, how Billy Graham says that. Let's pray. God, as, as we address those things that Jesus was confronting with each of the churches, we see a similarity in those things that you're calling us away from and the things that you're calling us to. Sometimes we're just sitting in idle. We're not going either way, and we're just really no good for anybody. Lord, help us to get in gear, to move forward, to move towards you, and to, to take some, some uncomfortable steps to make some steps that are difficult. Lord, uh, if we're not growing in the word, Lord, help us to, to get into the word. Lord, if we're not growing in relationship, Lord, help us to get deeper in prayer. Lord, if we're not feeling it, 
Lord, help us to, to open the word until we do. Lord, we ask that, that you change our mindset about the, our priorities. Lord, change our mindset about what we need to do in our nation. Lord, help us to change our mindset about what we need to do in our own communities. Lord, show us the opportunities. And Lord, if you need to, kick us in the rump and make us move. Make us move forward, Lord. Make us move forward and, and, and be people of action. Lord, help us to, to, to make the change in our own lives and make the change in the lives of others. Lord, let us not be complacent. Lord, let us not just be okay with the status quo. Lord, that, that uncomfortableness that is in our hearts all the time, let, us, let it burden us. Let us be responding to it and acting upon it. Let us move in ways that show that we are citizens of your kingdom, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Lord, change us, mold us, remake us today like your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength in me is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus made it joining us here today at Fellowship Bible Church. I hope that scripture has confronted some things in your own life and, and uh, I hope you're encouraged. I hope today has not just been a, a day to say, uh, you know, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm doing wrong and feel bad about yourself, but rather to do something about it, to make a change that, that truly, truly reflects uh, a, a desire to follow Christ in a new, in a different way. We hope that you're blessed by, by the words of Scripture and the thoughts today. I'd like you to meditate upon these this week and, and to move in a new and different way. Be, be transparent with yourself. Don't justify. Don't make excuses. Make a new way. Follow God in everything you do. May God richly bless you as you go about this week. God bless.